Now we come to the, uh, the moment that uh, I've been looking forward to since I was asked to preside today, and that is the time to introduce our special guest lecturer. Now, this person is a full professor at Medgar Evers College. I always start out with that first. And she always starts out with that first. But it, besides that, she is also a distinguished professor of English uh, in CUNY. That's a very, very high honor for a professor in the City University of New York, as well as among the community of higher ed educators in this country. Now, Elizabeth Nunez, actually was born in Trinidad. I bet you probably knew that. <laughs> and she went, she went to school there. And then after she finished secondary school, she came here to the USA. And she went to school to get her BA degree from Marion College in Wisconsin, which, by the way, awarded her an honorary doctorate. When did they do that, Elizabeth? About two years ago. About two years ago. She got an honorary doctorate from her alma mater in Wisconsin. And it was a doctorate in humane letters. Quite an honor. But anyway, she did that. And then she went on to get her master's and her PhD in English from New York University. Now, by the way, she got her doctorate while she was here at Medgar Evers College. And um, it was a happy time because there were many of us like that here, trying, including myself, trying to finish the doctorate young, very, very young, because we're still pretty young. <laughs> and, and I told her earlier today, we're young enough, we've been here a very, very long time, but we're still young enough to remember things well. She and I came the same year. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. But anyway. More about our distinguished professor and today's lecturer. She is the founder of the National Black Writers Conference, which uh, has a long and wonderful history here at Medgar Evers College and has brought this college great honor and recognition nationally. She founded it with John Oliver Killens, who was also our what, what do we call him? writer in residence here for several years before he, well, transitioned. At any rate, during the time that Elizabeth has been here, and that's what I call her because I consider her both a colleague and a friend, she has written, over, she's written five novels. Um, she's written, besides those novels, several scholarly articles because she is, after all, not only an artist, but an educator. And she has written and reflected on the academic environment and what happens when, as, as you teach and uh, lead students to become more literate and better writers and readers. So she has not only done great things outside of this institution, but she's done great things for this institution. Right now, she's chairing the Penn American Open Book Committee, and um, she is also an evaluator uh, for national and local programs in the arts and education. She has received a number of awards. One thing is, she just, um, remember I mentioned to you that she is, uh, she was the founder of the Black Rid National Black Writers Conference? Well, she produced, she was a producer of a very, very interesting TV uh, program called the Black Writers in America. And it was based on the 2000 National Black Writers Conference. Well, guess what? Dr. Nunez has been nominated for an Emmy Award. How's that? And we know that whatever the outcome, of course, I think is that she's going to win it. Um, it is at a big, great, 
wonderful honor to be nominated. At any rate, that's one thing I wanted to talk about. And the other thing that's kind of like something that also shows her commitment and service to the community. And someone came today, and that someone said, don't mention my name because it's not important. Someone came today, talked to Dean Castro, and said, I just want to be able to have you say something about doc what Dr. Nunez has done for us. And he told Dr. Castro about how Dr. Nunez had worked with a group from Grenada to write a proposal for an educational resource center in a poor area of Grenada. And it'll have a library, and it will have computers and study areas, and it will really be a wonderful addition to the Grenadian community for which this uh, proposal was written. And they just wanted us to say, on behalf of them, thank you, Dr. Nunez, for service to the community, for that service to the community, because she's done a lot. But at any rate, I think that I have talked enough about Dr. Nunez. I could talk some more about her, because she and I, I'm not, I'm not. But she and I have um, been at Medgar a long time, and we have a long, long lens with which to look at this college at this time and place. And our lens tells us as we stand here that all is good and it is better. So with that note, I would like to ask the distinguished human being, colleague, friend, writer, educator, Dr. Elizabeth Nunez, to please come forward and address us. Thank you very much, Vice President Doris Withers. And I have to say that I am superbly, superlatively honored that our president, uh, Dr. Edison Jackson, is here uh, on the front seat here, um, his support means a tremendous amount to me, as well as uh, my colleagues on the dais, including my dean, uh, Dean Evelyn Castro. Um, I consider myself an extremely fortunate human being. I am in the exact place I want to be. I, I don't know how many people of my age or how many women of my age can actually say that but I am working in the exact institution that I want to be in. I am teaching the exact students I want to teach. I, re I caught myself on Monday when I was teaching the class, sending a kiss to my students in the back room. And I think they kind of like looked up at me this way because I am in love with my students uh, every semester. Every semester it's greater and just more wonderful. I happen to have a, a good and solid uh, writing career as a novelist. In fact, my sixth novel is almost done, but it's already in contract, and I should be handing it in in the next couple of weeks, and it will be out early next year. So this, this feels great to me. And then, because I do a lot of talking, a lot of speeches all over the place, I have to tell you. And I get invitations that I would have died for a few years ago to write articles for, for journals. And um, in fact, I just finished one article for a journal, and there'll be another one coming out very soon that I have to, to do. Um, and, and then Essence Magazine asks me to write something for them. So it feels, it feels good. Um, and I'm going to tell you how I managed to be in this place. Um, we all have to thank God, first and foremost, for being in this place because we could not have been. But I want to tell you how I got to this route without any plan, really, in mind. But I first want to tell you about this morning. 
what happened to me this morning so that you can understand those of you sitting here who are juggling all kinds of lives in your, um, you know, up and down every day. And, and then you have professors like me who say, give me the paper exactly on this day at that time or eat it. <laughs> and you have professors like me say, if you are not here for you, the exam, you better be in the hospital. If you are not here for class, you better be in the hospital. And I am putting a lot of pressure, and I feel very good that I have 99% attendance all the time, that my students turn in their papers 100% all the time. And I feel good about that. And the reason I feel I can make that demand is that that demand was made on me. I want to tell you, as Dean, uh, as Vice President Withers just told you, we came in here really young. <laughs> I got married here. I was having, I had my son on August 11th um, here at Medgavers. September 1, I was in here teaching. I knew what it was like to leave a baby, run to a babysitter, run back to teach full time, full time, and go to graduate school at night because I had to work on a PhD. And I had a stepson who was five years old. I knew what that was like. I knew what it was to teach in a class and worry about what's happening to the baby. Finish class, run to, run to finish teaching, run to graduate school, run and pick up the baby, and all those plans. And my life is kind of like going full circle again because this morning, guess what? I had my granddaughter. In fact, I had to bring her to class on Monday because I couldn't find a babysitter. And I had her this morning and this morning I had to get up early because I had to make dinner for the person who's going to watch her this afternoon. So I had to make sure I had made dinner before I got in here. Then I had to bathe her and dress her and comb her hair because the, baby, the babysitter doesn't want, you know, she doesn't want the babysitter to comb her hair and give her a breakfast and talk to her and read to her and get everything set up and then drive to get here. So when I tell you, you bring your paper on time, I know what I'm talking about. And then after I teach my class today, I then am going to the New Lots, New Lots Library in Brooklyn. At 6.30, I've been invited to talk. So I'm getting back home at 9 o'clock tonight. So because I'm getting back home at 9 o'clock, I had to arrange for another babysitter to take over from the early babysitter so that person could be there for my granddaughter. So I want to tell you, if you're coming up to this plate with your bat in your hand, you understand that you have been selected. You have been selected. Not everybody gets a chance to stand up. And my metaphor may not be a good one because I don't know baseball at all. So what am I talking about? I know cricket anyhow. So if you're standing up there with the bat in your hand, you've been selected. You've been chosen to come, so you better be ready. And all the excuses, if you have me for a professor, I don't want to hear them. It means you have to wake up 2 o'clock, go to sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's the way it is. So I want to talk to you a little bit personally. Personally, and also to talk to you as what um, Vice President Withers said to you, that I was born in Trinidad. So I want to talk to you a little bit about being a Caribbean immigrant here in the United States. And I know that many of you uh, may not be first generation, you may be second or third, or you have some relative somewhere down the line who came here as an immigrant. And I also want to address my remarks to those of you whose families stretch back 400 years in this country. And I am speaking, of course, of the African Americans in the audience, whose mothers, fathers, grandparents, great, 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 great grandparents were born in the United States. Those of us of African descent, of course, have something in common. Our forefathers were snatched, and that's it, from the African continent and packed like sardines, and that's a euphemism because sardines had a good time compared to how we were packed, on ships for the crossing to the Atlantic. Some were dropped here in the United States, and some were dropped in the Caribbean. I don't know what we're fighting about, 
because it's just a, an, an accident of where you got dropped off. And my family got dropped off in the Caribbean. We have the same source and we share the same kind of brutal history that brought us to what is called the New World, which Columbus discovered. And of course, you know by now, he didn't discover us because there's something very sad about this story. And there's something sad about the story from if you came from the Caribbean, and that is there were no people of African descent in the Caribbean islands. And there were no people of Indian descent from India. And there were no people of Chinese descent from China. But you cannot go through any of the islands in the Caribbean and not see a number of people of African descent, a number of people from Indian descent, and a number of Chinese. And of course, you know how the Africans came. But the Indians and Chinese are not too far behind. Because when, after emancipation, when the English, in my case, but in other cases, the French, in other cases, the Spaniards, could no longer find people to work the fields, what they did was they, they, they offered five years of indentureship to the Indians. And the Indians came, and they came with their families, mother, father, children, came to, in my case, to Trinidad to work the land under horrible conditions. And the Chinese were a little more careful. They came, only the men came. They didn't come with their women. But of course, after you made that crossing, there was no going back. There was a promise they would send you back after five years, but that promise was hardly kept. And so you will notice that in the Caribbean, there are a lot of people who look as though they have Chinese in them. And that's because the Chinese men came. They didn't come with their women. And so the Chinese intermarried much more than um, the Indians did, although the Indians are doing that. But what I want to share with you is how little I knew of this history when I came to teach at Medgavas in 1972. How little I understood that my presence here, both my presence here in the United States, both how I got to the United States, how I got to get a scholarship in Wisconsin, and how I got to teach at Medgar Evers, all these facts were inextricably linked to the African-American struggle. But I want to tell you that when I began teaching here in 1972, when I'm sure most of you were an idea in the mind of God. <laughs> I had no idea that there was any connection between my green card that I received in 1968, the scholarship I received in 1963, or my presence at Medgavis College. I had no idea that this had anything to do with the African-American struggle. I was cute. I wore short mini skirts, because that was the fashion. I wore high heels. I loved teaching. I had spent my life practicing to be a teacher. My eldest sister said that she remembered when I was five years old, I used to line up everybody you know, and give lessons, because um, that's what I wanted to, be, to, to do. In the sanctuary of learning, Minds and space merge in a tranquil setting. Glass, air, light, and space for intellects to grow that blossom seeds of knowledge, unfolding in a contemplative world of books, reading, and information, sturdy, steady, and strong, creating success one student at a time. Maker Evers College, come. Medgar's College of the City University of New York, in conjunction with the Community Outreach Partnership Center, presents an economic vision for New York Entrepreneurship Partnerships and Community Building. It's the seventh annual Caucus on Business, 
keynote speakers include NYC Department of Small Businesses Service Commissioner Robert Walsh, Marilyn Gelber of Independence Community Foundation, and Congresswoman Nadia Velasquez. The conference is open to the general public, so please join us on Saturday, April 24th, 2004 at 1650 Bedford Avenue at the Medgarvis College Founders Auditorium, Brooklyn, New York, from 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. For further information, please call 718-270-6979. That's 718-270-6979. Or visit us at www.mec.cuny.edu. That's www.mec.cuny.edu. Admission is free. So please come on and join us at the 7th Annual Conference on Business. And we hope to see you there. In 1972, when I got a full-time job at Medgavis College, I believed I had arrived. I had arrived at the profession that I wanted to do. The last thing I no took notice of was the name of the college that employed me. Oh, I noticed the name was Medgavis College. I mean, when my friends asked me, where did I get a job? I said, oh, I got a job at Medgavis College. It was a name like any other name, could have been I got a job at Joe Blow College for all I cared. It would have been the same to me. And now I want to tell you exactly 31 years later, I'm here to tell you that that name means everything to me. And that teaching in a college named after Medgar Evers has had a profound effect on my life, has changed me considerably from that foolish, self-centered girl of 28 years ago, of 31 years, I almost told you what my age was, right? <laughs> <laughs> to the woman I, it just puzzled you up again. You just, to the woman I am today, a woman who is committed to the ideals of freedom, justice, and equality that embody the life of the man we honor with the name of this college. Let me say something to you, my dear students. I do not believe that our lives are an accumulation of meaningless, unrelated accidents. I don't think so. It's something to think about. I don't think, I just got goosebumps as I said that because it took me a long time to come to that understanding that our lives are not a series of meaningless, unrelated accidents. Or they may seem so to you. They may seem so because we are, un we are limited in our understanding. And I am just finished teaching Oedipus Rex by Sophocles and if there are any students in my class they know how limited we are in our understanding and how limited we are in our reason because this is what Oedipus discovers. That we often fail to figure out why things happen when they do and the way they do. We think they happen by chance. It is either the result of good luck or bad luck or having no luck. We complain when things do not happen the way we want them to happen, in the time we want them to happen. happen. But what I want to say to you today is that though the significance of things that happen to us is not always apparent to us at first, later in life we discover that the universe is unfolding the way it should. I said I joined the faculty of Medgavis in 1972. It seemed an accident to me, a stroke of good luck. I was on the number two train, and as it was pulling into the Nostrand Avenue stop, I noticed a sign that said, Met Gabbers. Well, I had just gotten my master's degree in English, and I thought, well, what better thing to do to teach there? I got off the train, went to the Carroll Street building. We called it the prep in those days. The humanities division, a lot of things have changed. It's no longer the prep, and it's no longer the humanities division. But the humanities division at that time was hiring faculty. And on the day I walked in, somebody who had gotten a job had just withdrawn from the job. That's it. That's how I got the train stop. Somebody had withdrawn from a job. And the, they were up against the wall. If the faculty weren't up, if the search committee wasn't up against the wall, I'm sure they'd have wanted a lot more credentials than I had to offer. Because I had no publications. I had just finished a master's degree. degree. I was green as my shirt. So they were up against the wall. Classes were opening, they had to have a faculty. They said, okay, they'll hire me. And that's how I got in. But this was not the only stroke of luck I had. In 1963, and again, a time when you were really an idea in the mind of God, 
I received a scholarship to a small college in Wisconsin. It seemed like an accident. Let me tell you what happened. An American came all the way to Trinidad and offered me a scholarship to all the way in Wisconsin. Well, I'm one of 11 children. You get a scholarship, tuition, books, what do you see? You're gonna go. I had no idea that in September of 63, when I came into that college, something very significant was happening in, I'm gonna give you a clue, in Birmingham, Alabama. What was it? No, something had happened in September of 63 in Birmingham, Alabama, when I entered that school in, in what? What? Nope, get me on something. Get it, get it, hit it on the head. I'm gonna give you a number, four. Four, you got it. In September of 1963, when I entered that school in Wisconsin, four little girls were bombed to death in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. When that academic year ended in June of 64, guess what happened? The bodies of three people were unearthed. Do you know who they were? Do you know who they were? Goodman. Cheney and Schwerner. Do you know why they were killed in Mississippi? Voter registration. So that my first school year in Wisconsin was framed by these two events. I come in September, four little girls bombed. I'm getting ready at the end of the first year, the bodies of these three young civil rights workers. I didn't have a clue. And I want to tell you, I didn't have a clue for many, many years until I came to Medgavers. Didn't have a clue. Didn't have a clue as to what these horrific events had to do with an American missionary coming to Trinidad and giving me a scholarship. Maybe I should have had a clue, and I'll tell you why. Because when I got to Wisconsin, there were no black people in the college. As a matter of fact, there were three other black people in the college, and they were all in the, my same situation. Another girl from Trinidad, who this American came to offer it, and two girls from Haiti who had the same experience. But other than that, there were no people of color, of any kind of color besides Caucasian, in that college. And in that town in Wisconsin, in the whole town, there were no people of color. So it should have rung a bell. But I'll excuse myself by saying to you that I came from a colony of England. And we had just gotten our independence. And some of you just don't know this. But growing up in a colonial situation, all my education geared me to England and to Europe. It never geared me to America. The English do not teach you about America. They don't teach you about the Caribbean, but they sure as heck don't teach you about America either. Because as far as they were concerned, America was once their colony, right? So I will excuse myself by saying that there was nothing in my education, nothing in my background to prepare me. But I should have had a clue as to how white this place was, because I did know African Americans in Trinidad. We had a military base in Trinidad, and I had seen African Americans. But I didn't make any connection. A couple of months later, well, I think it was after the first year, I took the Greyhound bus to Milwaukee. I had occasion to leave that little town and go to Milwaukee. And as the Greyhound buses would pass on the outskirts of the city, I saw African Americans. Not one or two or five or six, but hundreds of African Americans. And of course, you figure out what I figured out then. You figured out what I figured out then, that why did they go 3,000 miles to get the four of us when they could have gone 30 minutes and got some Americans, Americans who, it's, I, it's hard for me to say it, but it's the truth, probably merited that scholarship more than I did. Now put yourself in my place, 19 years old, they had a big party for me when I left Trinidad, of course. 
because I was getting this scholarship. There's no, that's one thing about immigrants. Immigrants have no way back. You have to understand that. Some people look at immigrants and say, oh, they're better or special than anybody else. They're not, there's no genetic coding in immigrants that makes them better. It is the simple fact that when you leave some place, you leave with the intention of improving your lot. And you also know there is no return. There is no return. The reason there is no return is that failure is not acceptable. That when you said you were going, it was not just your family that knew you were going, it was your town, it was the extended, it was the whole darn country that knew you were going. And you don't go back unless you succeed. So for four years, regardless of how my little brain computed the fact, no matter how my brain computed that fact, and you don't compute things completely, you see, because if we ever face facts, then we have to make a choice. And if you can't make a choice, we do something called denial. So that is what I did. So I want to, I sort of got off my text, but I'll get back on it. Basically, um, even in, in 1972, 10 years after the death, almost 10 years after the death of Medgavis College, I didn't know about this. I never thought of, of the price that had been paid for the opportunity I had. And by the way, most of you are reading Beyond the Limbo Silence. And Beyond the Limbo Silence is a novel that the City University has selected for, um, for almost everybody to read in the City University. And in that novel, you will see what I just told you and see an answer to that question and how that person feels. So basically, my idea, the one that I could deal with, because although you may know the truth, you deal with what you can deal with. And the idea I could deal with is, well, I deserve that scholarship. I was bright. I was smart. I worked hard. I studied. Who should I feel responsible for? I did it on my own. A few years after I had been at Medgavers, Dick Gregory came to Medgavers College. And I'll tell you, it's something I have just never ever forgotten. It was in the prep building, so you know it wasn't called the Carroll Street building. Of all that he said, I remember this. Someone had expressed amazement that he had taken time to come to Medgavis College. In those days, Dick Gregory was a very much sought after speaker. He could command any audience. He was a major celebrity. Dick Gregory held up his hand and said, I'm here because I have to be here. I am here because I want to wash away some of the blood. When we looked puzzled at him, he explained. He said he was, in, he was covered in a pool of blood so deep he was drowning. And of course, we are looking at him, and he's not covered with blood. The blood, he said, had climbed past his shoulders, past his neck, past his mouth, and was beginning to enter his nose so that he was going to die if he didn't find a way to subside this blood. You understand he's speaking metaphorically, right? He said that it was the blood of all those who had gone before him, who had sacrificed their lives to give him the opportunities he had. He said that as a door was open for him for more opportunities, when the door was opened and he got to get out of the door, he found himself stepping into a pool of blood and stepping over bodies that had fallen against the door. He said that to get out to the room to freedom, he had to climb over those bodies. And with each step he took, he sunk deeper and deeper into their blood. Perhaps Vice President Withers remembers when he came, and I can't remember, this was like, like in the 70s, in the 70s. And I remember it absolutely. He told us that he was there at the college, not so much for our sake, but for his sake. And I can tell you that today. I'm teaching not so much for my students' sake, but for my sake. I can tell you that in all honesty. Every time he did a good deed in the cause of freedom and equality, some of the blood, he said, got washed away. And some of the stench of rotting bodies got washed away. 
If you read my second novel, Beyond the Limbo Silence, you will see I have a character who reminds us of those words. For the first time, I stopped to think of the name of the college where I was working. And for the first time, I stopped to think of the sacrifice of the life of the man for whom this college is named. And the first, for the first time, I stopped to think about the debt I owed him and about how I would repay him, if I could repay him. That's another thing, you know. It's not that you want to repay him, is, but, but can you? Can you repay such sacrifice? I started by telling you that things that happened to me are not accidental. Well, I look back now and I think that getting that scholarship to an all-white college in Wisconsin was not accidental. That noticing the sign for Medgavis through the, college of a sub through the window of a subway car was not accidental. That that person who had withdrawn from the humanities division was not accidental. You see, this is how I see it. I got my scholarship to Wisconsin because the civil rights movement was brewing, because there were people willing to lay down their lives for me. That college in Wisconsin chose to integrate the school with students of color from the Caribbean rather than with African-American students leaves a question in my mind that to this very day continues to haunt me. Did I participate in their deception? Did I allow them to take advantage of my foreignness, my foreign self, with my foreign accent, so they could implicate me in a distinction between a black person born in the Caribbean and a black person born in Africa, both of whom had been snatched from Africa, born in America or born in the Caribbean, I mean. You'll have to read my novel, Beyond the Limbo Silence. It sounds like a PR thing, but it's true. You have to read my novel, Beyond the Limbo Silence, to get that answer. But here is what I knew then. I knew that though my parents had comfortable lives, they did not have the extra money to send me to college in America. If I hadn't gotten that scholarship, I probably would not be here today. I know this too, that if I were looking for a way to repay the debt I owed to the, li to the lives that propelled schools like the college I'm in into finding a way to integrate their campuses, well, I found that way here at Medgavis College. You see, I don't think it is accidental that I am in a college where many students are first and second generation or even third generation Caribbean em immigrants, as I was when I came to college. Here at Medgavis College is my chance to wash away some of the blood that Dick Gregory talked about. But it is just that, a chance, an opportunity. It is up to me to recognize that opportunity and to do something about it. I'm talking about me, but I'm talking about you too, okay? You have to figure this out yourselves. So I am honored and grateful to speak to you today as I, as I am honored, as I am honored and grateful each time I get the opportunity to teach you at Medgavis College. My son, Jason, was born here. His father is an African American. Though my son, Jason, is cognizant of his Caribbean heritage through me, he identifies more strongly with the country where he was born and where he has lived his life. He identifies as an African American. I say to my son, Jason, that if I were born African American, I would fight to create a law that would require every immigrant that comes to this country, every student that comes to this country, every person who wants to become a citizen to take a course in the history of the civil rights movement. For here are the facts. Because of the civil rights mo movement, immigration quotas for people of color were increased. Who do I mean by people of color? I mean Caribbean people, I mean African people, that's a slam dunk. But I mean Latinos, I mean Mexicans, I mean Koreans, I mean Japanese, I mean Chinese, I mean Asians, I mean Arabs, I mean other Middle Easterners. What I am saying is that because of the civil rights movement, all these people, Caribbean people, 
African people, Latinos, Mexicans, Koreans, Japanese, Chinese, Indians, other Asians, Arabs, people from the Middle East. And now I add people from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, because you know those are the people coming in now, were given an opportunity to live and work in America. If you don't believe me, check this out. In 1964, the Civil Rights Bill ending racial discrimination was passed. One year later, in 1965, legislation removing national origin as a criterion for immigration was removed. Do you get me? In 64, the Civil Rights Bill is passed, ending racial discrimination. In 65, the one thing holding up people of color was the, you had to conform to country of origin, and that was removed. Until that bill was passed, here are some statistics. The quota for all Asians was 2,900 of all Asians. By that I mean Koreans, Japanese, Indians, every country that is not Europe, all of them together. Only 2,900 people could come to the United States a year. Of all of Africa, and you know how huge Africa is, of everybody in Africa, and I think um, the Caribbean was pushed up in that, 1,400 people. Figure it out. And you know how much for Europe? 149,667. I'm talking about 1963. That's not a, I mean 1965. That's not a long time ago. And I want you to know that although that bill was passed, it took until June of 68 for it to be implemented. In other words, you know what that means, resistance. A bill passed, and you're going to have resistance for three years. So you want to know how you got here? Let me tell you something. After I finished college in, Ju in June, no, I, I finished college in in January of 67. I went back home to Trinidad figuring that's where I'd live. I had no intentions of coming back. This is another accident. Sounds like my life has been a whole bunch of accidents. But after a year in Trinidad, I kind of started getting restless and feeling, oh, I don't think everybody expects me to get married and have children. And I had visions of having a career. So one day, I decided to stroll into the US Embassy and apply for a green card. Now, any of you who have ever applied for a green card know that this is like a big, big event. The documentation you have to do, the years you have to wait, God knows who else you have to bribe. Then, three months later, three months later, in August of 68, three months later after I applied, the American Embassy calls me in. I go in, and I remember the guy who interviewed me. He was white, portly, smoking a cigar. And he says to me, do you know anybody in America? No, I said. Do you have a job in America? No, I said. He leaves the room. He comes back. Do you have any money in the bank? $200, I said. How will you get a job in America? Well, I have a degree, I said. I suppose I could apply for a job. He walks out of the room, comes back 15 minutes later, green card. That's how I got my green card. Now, you know when I discovered how I got my green card? A year ago. I discovered how I got my a green card a year ago. You know why? Because in June of 68, that immigration bill was finally implemented. And I walked in there in July or August of 68. That man had to fill quotas. Didn't matter what I was doing, he had quotas to fill. Somebody had made a demand on him that you better bring in more people of color into America because we're not going to stand for this anymore. And so it didn't matter what I had. I was just a person of color. Give it to her, let her go. And that's how I got my green card. Without a job, without money in the bank, without knowing anybody, I landed here. The only thing he told me is, you've got two months to leave. You have to leave in two months. I see we are passing up time. And basically, um, it's pretty much, the rest of what I would have to say to you is all pretty much in the same vein. Except I do want you, I'm not trying to foster guilt in anybody. I really am not. 
I just want you not to take for granted your presence here. And I just don't want you to take for granted your presence in this institution. And I also want you to think about what you're going to do. And I want to leave you with one more message, one more eye image, an image that is so much in my head. Any of you who have relatives in the Caribbean or Africa or whatever, you know that when you become a big shot, you have all kinds of things attached to you that you are a big shot. One day I opened the newspaper in New York and I saw Mayor Dinkins handcuffed on the front page of the newspaper. I could not believe it because there is no country in the world that I could think of where a former leader, a mayor of a major city, will voluntarily allow himself to be handcuffed and photographed for the front page of the newspaper. That was extraordinary to me. Now, do you know why he allowed himself to be handcuffed on the front page of the newspaper? Anybody? Anybody? You guys don't read the papers? He allowed himself to be handcuffed on the front page of the newspaper because he was protesting the 41 shots put into Amadou Diallo. Do you know what this African-American mayor who had nothing to gain because he's got a lot of money and connections, a lot of money and connections, and known all over the place, nothing to gain by this embarrassment, by this humiliation for not an African-American, but for an immigrant of color. That's just the image I want you to, to leave you with. So don't separate yourself. Don't put yourself into two camps. You have one source. And also think of what you're going to do, that you have an opportunity here at Medgavers. How are you going to use that opportunity to remove some of the great respect? Now, I want you to read my book, so I'm going to tell you what my website is. www.elizabethnunez.com. Thank you very much. <laughs> Medgavis College of the City University of New York, in conjunction with the Community Outreach.